Hello, and welcome to the Pop Off PC Mag Show, where we talk about video games. And in 2020, the video game everybody's talking about is coming out. It's Cyberpunk 2077. But before it was a video game, it was a tabletop game. And today, we have a very special guest, the creator of that tabletop game, Mike Pondsmith, founder of R Talsorian Games. Mike, thanks so much for joining us. No problem. My name is Mike Pondsmith, and as we traditionally say, I'm the guy who killed your cyberpunk character. So, what are we up to today? Yeah, so uh, for, for uh, folks that don't know, like, who are you? Like, what's, what's some of your background? Okay. Oh, uh, boy, that's, that's long and scary, actually. Uh, I'm an Air Force brat. Uh, I've traveled around the planet, seen a lot of weird things. Uh, somewhere along the line with a degree in psychology and a degree in graphic design, I ended up starting a game company back in the 80s. Um, at the time, I was trying to get into uh, video games, which I did for a while with a company called California Pacific many, many years ago. And video games are pretty small time then. And the market that was expanding, I found myself kind of tossed into was tabletop games. Uh, didn't hurt that my, my wife, uh, who was at that point, the girl I was trying to date, was also into tabletop games. So you know, I had to show up just to get my, my shot in. Nice. At any rate, um, I've been doing this now for, I'd say, upwards of about 30 years. I have uh, worked on all kinds of various projects from Star Wars, uh, a couple d d projects, but I primarily be known for what we do over at Artel Sorian Games. And uh, that would include Cyberpunk, which everybody knows, but also Mechton, a giant robot game, Teenagers from Outer Space, Castle Falkenstein, Dragon Ball Z, you name it, we've done a lot of games. Nice. Um, so kind of what we, the first question we kind of had here was, um, you know, we've seen a lot of games that adapt other media. You know, we have plenty of games based on movies, based on comic books, based on TV shows, you know, common. We don't see so much, though, is, is games based on other games. And granted, video games, tabletop games are very different, but they're, you know, they're both still types of games. So I guess, you know, in, in working with CD Projekt Red or just, you know, just in, in correspondence with them, like, has that created kind of different challenges or is it beneficial in some ways when a game is adapting another game? I think it would have been a bigger problem if I hadn't worked in video games. And I was actually in the middle of video game stuff when they called us up way back in you know, the tail end of the early 2020s. Um, because of that, and the fact that at the time the project I'd been working on was Matrix Online, yeah, I had a pretty good handle for what they had to do. And in addition, my job at Microsoft previously had been to go to various studios and look at how they did their process and you know, how they basically got their games out the door. So walking into that situation, man, I probably knew more than most licensor would, you know, they would have a concept of because I had to do it. I had to figure out how to make these various games work like Matrix. You know, how do you do a movie and make it fit into a game? That being said, um, there are differences. And um, as I used to describe to uh, various students I had over the years, um, you have to think of the hierarchy of games in a certain way, in fact, of, of any entertainment. The easiest, the most accessible is probably up at the movie level. So think of like a pyramid and there's this narrow pointy gold part at the top. And that's the pyramid of you get a movie. And a little bit below that, you get TV or Netflix. And then a little below that, you get a comic. And then a little below that, but getting wider, you get a book. And then way down at the bottom, it used to be you got a game. And that pyramid also reflects the amount of information you can show your audience at any given time. If you're talking about a movie, they see exactly what the characters within that movie see. And it's a very narrow bandwidth. Uh, if you're talking about a comic, they see a bit more, you have more episodes. If you're talking about a book, you could have a whole chain. When you get to gaming, you can actually deliver a ridiculous amount of content. And that literally means, you know, in our case, like 55 books worth of cyberpunk stuff. That's a lot of stuff. Yeah. And a ridiculous amount of content. And one of the things that CD and over here at Tau we had to work out was how to best show that content in a way where it was going to take 15 hours and you could concentrate on the game 
and mm -hmm. where it was immediately accessible to people. They didn't have to go read something else. They could look at it and go, I get this world. And to do that, you cannot design a video game in the same way that you design a tabletop game because it is a much narrower information bandwidth. So, you know, we had to figure out how to tell the story and help people see that story, what was going on right away. Luckily, uh, Cyberpunk, as we've done it over here, Tal, is very, very accessible. And I made a point when I designed the game originally to make it an accessible universe where people could go, hmm, okay, I get that. I, I see that on the street. I see, I see that, that in your background right now. Yeah, in my background. Yeah, literally, this is, you don't want to see what my house actually looks like right now. You're lucky the dog isn't barking right now. So, um, yeah, accessibility becomes, you know, an important part. And you do that differently in a video game than you do in a tabletop game. A tabletop game, um, I used to describe it as you get to see behind the curtain and know how it all works, but you have to work for it. Where in a video game, you don't see how it was constructed. They may be built the same way in terms of the mechanics and numbers, but you don't see it as a player. What you see is the complete movie, so to speak, the first, the total experience. Yeah, it's interesting. You, you can even see in the way like how different designers have approached turning D and D into video games, the different kind of systems they choose to adapt or disregard. Um, yeah, there's just, yeah, it's just it's, it, certain things work in one space and, and don't translate over to another. Um, yeah, is why that's really clean. Um, now I'm gonna say something maybe maybe a little controversial, and I I love tabletop games. I play a lot. They're very near and dear to my heart. But I think it's fair to say that they're maybe a little bit more niche than video games. Oh, yes, yes, okay. definitely. I think uh, that is changing a lot because what's happened is um, we've had a jump in the quality of tabletop games, and also they're played by a lot more people now. You know. I, I had a, one of those moments a few years back I had where um, I was meeting a friend for lunch at E3 and we were all sitting around and he said, yeah, I've, I've got this guy I'm going to be, you know, talking to you. You've seen him, Ben Diesel. I'm going, <laughs> okay, Ben Diesel is coming to lunch. Interesting. And I'm sitting here and Ben Diesel plonks on down and we're talking and he's telling me about his D&D character. This is an amazing step because before tabletop games were theoretically a bunch of nerds who were thoroughly uncool, thoroughly unhip. And although many of us knew that, you know, differently, um, getting some guy like Vin Diesel in there doing a video or doing a tabletop game and really getting off on it is like, wow, we've arrived. Someone's actually cool who's doing this. We can point to you and say, hey, dude, we're like him, man. Nice. Yeah, he so, has this whole like game studio, right? Like Tiger oh, yeah. Studios or something. Yeah. Yeah, there, there's uh, like Joe Mangiana. I'm sorry, Joe Mangiano. I always screw up his name. It's long in the time. But at any rate, Joe has a studio too. And, you know, we've heard people all through the industry. Um, many, many, many years ago, I remember we got a call uh, from the set of Goodwill Hunting. I think it wasn't. So Robin, oh, wow. Robin Williams was actually running a cyberpunk game. Oh, nice. That's awesome. Out a book so he could finish his cyberpunk game. And I was thinking, okay, we, we're, we've arrived, you know? Cool. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's always been a much smaller market. So, yeah, but as more people are getting into it and, you know, potentially through like this big, you know, popular new video game, like have you seen, you know, just renewed interest in the tabletop game because of oh, the yeah. video game? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, we released first the Jumpstart Kit for uh, what we call Cyberpunk Red. Cyberpunk Red, uh, the best way to look at it is we think of cyberpunk like you would a movie in a lot of ways, the cyberpunk world. So 2013 is like Star Wars. It's kind of rough hewn. You're kind of getting the ideas of what's going on. You're meeting the characters. And 2020 is sort of the larger story, maybe beginning of Empire strikes back and all that but we had to extend that because there's this big gap between everything that happens in 2020 you have a bomb gets dropped we have a corporate war people get killed all this stuff goes on and at the end of it, we're going hmm, so how do we get from here to 77 so 
what we did was we uh, sat down with the CD crew and we decided to split the timeline like a couple time lords. Um, the time timeline essentially is we go all the way up to the 60s and they go from the 60s beyond. And then we are constantly talking back and forth like, hey, can we put this character in here? Oh yeah, well, could you bring this character and you know show their backstory over here? And you know, we go nice. back and forth. So it's, it's pretty coordinated. Um, the interesting part is that um, when we do that, we have to find ways that once again, take a lot of information and narrow it down to smaller amounts so that people in the video game side can easily grasp concepts. And later they'll go back, they'll read the books. For us, it's also been great because Cyberpunk Red, which we just released last week, is actually that interim period between 2020 and going up to the 2077 period. So it's everything that happened between those two points, how the world rebuilt itself and how it slowly becomes what you'll see on the screen in 77. So yeah, if, if we had said, oh, we're gonna do an alternate version of the world, then you wouldn't have to explain 77, but we really thought it was cool that we could see this continuity all the way back from 13, all the way forward to 77. And I think fans really appreciate that because they can see the history and the background. If they're you know, wandering around the game, they're gonna see all kinds of Easter eggs that probably wouldn't make a lot of sense if they were only coming in from the video game level. And part of that is the, the CDPR crew, a lot of them play Cyberpunk, right? They still play Cyberpunk. So yeah, they know- you, you would hope so, yeah. Yeah, Red has uh, all kinds of you know really cool things that are buried also in 77 and vice versa. So when you guys get your copy of 77, look around, don't just go, oh, I mean, it's experience. Really look at things because we've hidden all kinds of stuff throughout that environment. And we talk about it in red as well. So you'll see, for example, stuff about characters that appear in red who, you know, it's 25 odd years later and, you know, they're a bit older, but they're not ancient and they're there. They'll show up. They're in the backgrounds and places. So it's really cool that because of that, and I think because it's a pretty darn cool looking book, I mean, I say so myself, uh, Red has had a phenomenal um, response from the audience. They really, really like it. And I think part of that is the fact that they wanted to know more about the world and now they can. Cool. So you have this very rich uh, world and you have you know history for it that, that spans decades. Um, but I kind of wanted to ask, uh, since you know, since first creating cyberpunk in the '80s, like, how has your own vision of this genre changed and evolved as we get to like you know the actual 2020, which is you know a, a tech dystopia, but maybe not the same tech dystopia as, uh, as you may be. It's starting to look pretty similar, actually. <laughs> yeah. Uh, my my friends and my son and uh, have given me direct for years, going, you know, Mike, think happy thoughts because <laughs> the stuff you're writing now is like getting too close. And after 2020. I always thought it was really terrible that we had a 2020 that was a terrible year. I know, right? Yeah. And I wrote about 2020 and a lot of uh, things I wrote about like plagues and civil unrest and this, all this stuff going on. Oh, look, we're doing it. Um, yeah, really right from the start, like January, yeah. April, Feb, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I, I remember looking at that just going, oh man, you know, because we, we approached 2020 and went, oh, this will be our year. Cyber 2020 and, and red. Oh, Lord. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so um, what's changed? Um, in some ways, it is less that my picture of it has changed as much as I think the overall genre has changed. And I can see that. And I think we've had some influence on that. Um, the cyberpunk genre was originally a very cerebral type of genre. It was one which encouraged you to think about very, very big, deep questions. So, you know, Blade Runner is not an action film. Blade Runner, one of my favorites, but it's not a film that you go, oh, action, yeah, blam, blam, blam. Mm -hmm. When there is violence, it is very measured violence to show certain things going on in that world and how it works. Um, but it is a movie that is designed to make you walk out of there going, hmm, what 
what the heck? What did that mean? You know, it seems like Roy Batty was more human than the guy who, who was going to kill. Oh, wait a minute. Yeah, so what's going on with those unicorns? Yeah. Yeah, and all that. Yeah, I actually took up origami so I could like leave unicorns around. <laughs> nice. That's incredible. Uh, I, there's a side story of that about me leaving tiny unicorns on the uh, deck of a rotating restaurant in San Francisco. And they'd go by and they'd disappear in the distance past other diners. You'd go, oh, look, it's a unicorn. Look, there's a gold one. <laughs> But at any rate, um, it's a cerebral thing. And 2049 is even more cerebral. It's really taking those questions of reality. What is what life? How do you live it? Um, what constitutes a lived life? All these things are crammed into it. But as cerebral pieces, they have two problems. And that is, I think, endemic to most cyberpunk of that time. Uh, and that is that your heroes do not have a lot of agency. They are there to place you into the frame. So Roy Batty looks more like the hero for all of his weirdness than Deckard because Deckard basically is the passive person trapped in that environment. And in an action move, he'd storm into, you know, Gat and say, I'm out of here. Take my badge. Slam, you know, and that would be an action movie. But no. He is there to represent how we observe that world. Cyberpunk came from our, our version, came from a different space, which was we wanted people to be the heroes because nobody wants to do a role playing game where you're playing a guy who, you know, has a drug habit, you know, habit. He's, uh, you know, being driven around by, you know, a, a pitiless corporation that's, you know, controlling his life. You know, you don't want to be the guy in that situation not in an RPG. RPGs are about agency. So we made a game that will allow you to be a rock and roll badass hero. But we also were really careful to scale it down so that while you were Mr. Rock and Roll Badass Hero, you also did not save the world. You were not a superhero. You were just your local hero. Um, an example I really love is a movie called Streets of Fire. It came out a bunch of years back. And in there, we have a guy, long trench coat, long gun over his shoulder, and he comes back from an unspecified war to find out his girlfriend has been basically kidnapped by a booster gang. And he's not going to save the world. It's going to hell. But he's going to get his girlfriend back from the booster gang. And all of that requires a certain level of badass agency as he goes through and finds ways to stop the bikers and, you know, get in contact with his allies who are going to help him and, you know, everything else that goes with that. So what I've seen is cyberpunk has become more agency driven and the good cyberpunk doesn't go down the road of being an action movie with cyberware. It becomes cyberpunk and the crappy environment and all the things that go with it. But you have agency, you can do things. Um, another favorite of mine, which weirdly enough is not, uh, I would not call directly cyberpunk, is The Expanse. Okay, yeah. The Expanse novels, the novels are not quite the cyberpunk, but the way it's envisioned in the TV show is great because I look at it and go, yep, that's cyberpunk future in space. And it's not so far removed from where we are that we can't see those bones underneath it. Um, where, you know, um, Altered Carbon is a little more towards the hero level. It's a little more what you're doing is saving the world, you know, or at least making enormous changes in it. Where Altered Carbon covers that direction, you look at Expanse, you realize this guy ends up changing the entire framework of his dystopian science fiction future planetary system. And he's mostly doing it to save his crew. You know, he's looking at going, oh my God, we're all gonna die here. You know, we're in the middle of this war and this horrible thing is happening and this, this nanotech plague is coming across and how do I get my people out of here? And then it's only later he realizes, well, okay, I have just messed up the plans of people far higher up the food chain than I am. And I'm now an actor. 
But what's interesting is the main character never becomes a majorly conscious actor. He never shows up and says, I'm here to save all of you. He goes, okay, we got out of that one. How do we get to the next one? And that's oh. interesting. Yeah, because that's not even a matter of like aesthetic. That's just, yeah, you're like just how like the, the nature of the characters in their world. Right. Yeah, that's. And so what had happened I, in Blade Runner, you never had that moment when, you know, where Deckard was like saying, okay, that's it. You know, I'm going to take control of my destiny. The closest he gets is I'm going to grab Rachel. I'm going to make a run for it. And that wasn't even in the original film. You know, it ends with, I'm grabbing Rachel, and we go somewhere. The door closes, we're out. We're out. But, uh, uh, speak, speaking of being out, uh, this is all very fascinating. I, I could talk about this forever and ever, but um, we're, we're running, out, uh, we're running out of time here. Uh, but no, that's, that's a good kind of last question. Um, yeah, just kind of talk about the genre as a whole. Um, yeah, sorry, I, I like to talk. No, about this, is, this, is, this is fascinating for sure. Um, so yeah, Cyberpunk 27, the game is out soon. Cyberpunk Red, tabletop game is out. You can get it, experience the entire world. Mike yep. Bonsmith, thanks so much for joining us. This was awesome. Well, you know, if we get lucky, maybe we'll be able to do this again sometime. I would love that. I'm sure other people on the team would love that too. Okay, um, well, I'm around. In cool. fact, considering that they just done new lockdown, I'm really around. There you go. That's 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 cyberpunk. <laughs> yeah, it, right. it is. It's too close. Cool. Uh, yeah, and thanks, thanks for watching, everybody. Okay. Ciao, everyone.